So I've got Ryan back, but it's not gonna be as good as the last time. So, um, yes, in the new year, Ryan back for the first time. And the reason for that intro is the topic of today, which we're going to talk about some of the worst movie sequels. Oh, you were being topical. Yeah. I thought you were just being a jerk. Well, I, I, I can do both. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, I just, I'll just note this, and maybe it won't matter, but this won't be the first video that goes out using my new camera, but it is the first one I'm recording with it. So if this looks like high def garbage, that's why and I apologize. I'm only holding up two fingers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Ryan, first of all, Happy New Year, welcome back. Thank you, Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to all of your like 10 million followers that you've gotten now. So oh, awesome. I wish. Um, but so yeah, um, when, I, when I told you that, you know, let's talk about some of the worst movie sequels, one of the things I didn't do was set out a criteria because mm -hmm. I have mine, and I kind of wanted to leave you to come up with your own. So what was the criteria you had for for the ones you want to bring up? Um, so it was a good question. Like when, as soon as you said, like, worst sequels, I was like, okay, well, the ones that everybody's going to talk about, Godfather 2, Wrath of Khan, the ones that everybody hates. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. You can cut that. <laughs> I, I won't. I, I'm, I'm going to let... People have heart attacks yeah. for a hot second. Um, no, the first one I because th I kind of instantly went to I was like, okay, we do need some criteria here because like, and my mind instantly went to some of the horror franchises where I was like, there's like twenty different Friday the Thirteenth movies or mm -hmm. Halloween movies. I was like, I first of all I haven't seen nearly <laughs> that many of them, but I was like, some of these are just bad. Like, where's the cutoff? So, for my criteria, I kind of went with a few different things. Um, I went with. Sequels that probably just should not have been because of one reason or another. Either the story didn't lend itself to a sequel or too much time had passed and it's like the relevance of this movie is just not there anymore. Um, also, if the movie was particularly bad, um, that helped. Although there are some movies that I did bring that I would argue are not bad movies but might meet a certain criteria for a bad sequel. Okay, that'll be interesting. Um, some of the other criteria that I came up with, um, which I'll talk a lot about, are movies that kind of betray or negate something that was special and important and likable about the preceding movie. Um, so a movie that kind of like, hey, we really like this one, we're going to make a sequel, and the storyline, either by necessity or accident, kind of gives the middle finger to what you just saw. Mm. Almost as if the previous movie's storyline didn't accomplish anything or wasn't didn't matter. Okay. Um, and sometimes I think those are more of like the worst offenders. Um, and if I come up with another idea on the fly, I'll probably integrate it. But those were basically the ones I wasn't just thinking, I wasn't just thinking of like purely bad movies because I could talk about like Grease 2 or Blues Brothers <laughs> 2000 or something. I, I had two major criteria. Basically these, these were exclusionary criteria. Okay. So things that fell under these, this was how I thinned the herd because okay. you're right. You look at bad sequels, it's a lot. Right. But automatically excluded anything that was direct to video. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, that was off the table. The next thing was that for me, it had to be a major drop off from the quality of the pre immediately <laughs> preceding film. Right. Which gets me out of most of, say, your, your long running horror franchises because most of them don't drop off. Like, Jaws 4 is bad. But it's only a little bit worse than Jaws 3, which is only a little bit worse than Jaws 2. The biggest drop-off is from Jaws 1 to Jaws 2. So if you're going to argue any of the, by my criteria, as the bad sequel, it's Jaws, Jaws 2. Because it's the biggest drop right. from the one that came immediately before it. And uh, Yeah, and I actually, I probably had that in mind too. Which is why I didn't include Weekend at Bernie's 2. <laughs> So that though that was my major criteria. Okay, I I've, like that. Yeah. I've got how many did I write down? I think I came up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Eight. I got I've got thirteen here that are I feel are That's at least about worth, double what I brought, worth so. touching on. Okay, well three of these I would lump together for all. No, actually four of these I would lump together for all committing the exact same sin. Okay, so I'll, I'll save those. Um, so you know what? Let's actually start with one that you mentioned, but I think is worth bringing up. Blues Brothers 2000. Because you want to talk about not, all, not only a movie that didn't need a sequel, 
whose time had passed. Yeah. And has a serious drop off from the previous film. Now, I'm actually, I'm even a little bit of a Blues Brothers 2000 apologist insofar as I do think the musical numbers are actually really good. Mm -hmm. Nothing else about it is any good. And the musical numbers, honestly, at least for me, weren't even the biggest highlight of the original film anyway. They were great, but it was those two characters together. And guess what you don't have in the sequel because one of them's dead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, 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 that's, that, I, <laughs> had I even given it some consideration, I would have had it on the list for the exact same reason. Um, picking back on that, because the first movie that I kind of thought of because of the time really had passed is, and this is probably the objectively the worst movie of the ones that I came up with, was mm-hmm. Basic Instinct 2. <laughs> Here's a question. Have you seen it? Because yeah. I, oh my yeah. God. I, I made the effort to see it. I, uh, I rented it. I paid money for it. I was like, I'm, this is going to happen to me. Let's see it. Uh, and it was... <laughs> I think that's the way to frame it. This is... So, watching that movie is just something that happens to you. Right. And... It's like getting hit by a bus. Right. And until I watched like the first 45 minutes of... Um, uh, uh, what's the gray one? Uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. Uh-huh. I did watch like 45 minutes of it. I've um, actually seen all of that first uh, one. Okay. Until that movie, Basic Instinct 2 held the record of the movie that I was most bored watching people <laughs> try to be sexy. Like, oh, uh, yeah. And now, so getting back into it, because I do think there's a notice, because I love the first Basic Instinct. I, like, objectively, I, okay, it has the I was going to ask, like, how, I, I, I'm, I'm willing to accept that Basic Instinct 2 is significantly below, but how high are we actually placing the first basic instinct? Okay, the first basic instinct has the reputation, Sharon Stone showing something to the audience, which the the leg scene and everything. She's naked for half the movie. It's just a. It's you could call it a soft core or, or, or yeah. It's it's. I would call it a medium core. If you take all of that out of it, it's actually still a really engrossing murder mystery, and it's a good thriller. And I think it. I think it actually it holds up now. That could be me, maybe like projecting, but I, I I like the first Basic Instinct. Now, but you're certainly going to watch that movie for one particular reason, and the reason was Sharon Stone, who even in the first Basic Instinct, I think was in her mid thirties. Yeah, the sequel comes out fifteen years later. I think she's pushing fifty, and I don't want to be ageist, and I think you can certainly be sexy, but the reason you go to see a movie like that probably isn't to see a woman, no matter how beautiful and sexy she can be. Of that age, who looked like it? Now, okay, those are the. Okay, okay, we're, 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 we're let, 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 let me try and save you from yourself. Let me ask yeah. you this: Was were they trying to have the character be sexy in the sequel in the same way she was sexy in the first one? A little bit, because my my, I think the way maybe we we pull you out of this hole you've dug yourself into is by is by pointing out that you can be sexy in your fifties. But it is a different type of thing. Someone in their 50s trying to be sexy in a way that someone in their 30s can get away with is kind of painful. And I think they're trying to do both. I think they're trying to be a little bit of the sexy, like, in the 30s. And they're, they're going mm. for that and failing. Now, the other thing is, it's just, it's a bad and it's a boring movie. <laughs> but I think probably the biggest cardinal sin of this movie is, and this is something that I will get to with some of my other movies, is one of the things that I really enjoyed about the first one and one of the great things about it is the ambiguous ending. And it is something like where if you create a sequel, the ending to the first one is no longer ambiguous. You've created a, def- a definitive like end note for that and thereby spoiling part of it and ruining, at least for some of the audience, like what was special about the first one. So I think it was, it was a sequel that A should not have been made because Basic Instinct should not have had a sequel. Like, yeah. the ambiguity of that ending makes it special if you if you extend the cha- the next chapter, you ruin that. B, if they were going to make a sequel, the time to do that was ten years earlier than they did. Yeah. Um, and B, it was just, like, I, I don't even remember who her co-star was, some British guy, but he was wooden and just, like... Yeah, it was, it was a horrible, like, performance. She seemed bored by it. I don't think she wanted to do it. I don't know. I'm sure it was the cash in the check and proving that she still could. Yeah. But, now, so. Si- since you sort of... Sharon Stone, bo- if you're watching this, I still love you. 
Since you brought up the general idea of movies that shouldn't have sequels, I think The Elephant in the Room in that category is actually one that I don't have on my list. Okay. But I think most people's minds jump to Highlander 2. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I... <laughs> it's... Yes. What, was that on your Well, I, I, I thought of it. I didn't even include it because I thought you might include it. But... Well, no, I didn't. Here's why, though. Not that it's good. No. Because it's not. But here's why I find Highlander 2 oddly endearing. Because one thing it is not is lazy. Huh? They tried. <laughs> they try. I don't know what they were trying to do, but whatever it was, they tried hard. You can see the effort up on the screen. And of all the sins of that movie, and they are legion, mm -hmm. it is not a lazy cash grab sequel. It's insane, and it ruins the mythology of the first one, no matter which version you see. Mm -hmm. But to me, the biggest cardinal sin of most sequels, and again, I've got four lumped together that I'll br that all commit this mm -hmm. to some degree, it's being lazy. Yeah, and relying on the same stuff that yes, you did the first time. Yes, that to me is the biggest sin any sequel can commit. Sure. And I don't think Highlander 2 does that. That does not it make it a good movie. It has completely original sins. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> it, it invented its own <laughs> sins, if we're being honest. Sure, sure. That, that thing really is a, a bizarre monstrosity. Um, all right, here was one that I had, because this... This represented something that I don't think happens all that often, but boy, did it not work. And that's a like a complete shift in genre. Okay. The Chronicles of Riddick. Okay. I I've, I have not heard, seen this one. I you saw the don't. first... Was the first one Pitch Black? <laughs> first one was Pitch Black. I saw Black. the first one. I thought it was fine. I like Pitch Black a lot, but Pitch Black is a lean and mean you know sci-fi horror story right, right, it's right. an alien yeah world. it's an alien yeah it is but it's it's very it's very tight it's very basic it mm -hmm. is playing on very basic fears of the dark of isolation mm -hmm. and then for the sequel they basically tried to do conan the barbarian in space and not only does it bear almost no resemblance to the previous movie and even Riddick himself as a character barely resembles the character he was in the previous movie. Mm -hmm. But the tone is, it, like, it, it really literally feels like they plucked this guy out of this one genre and franchise and dropped him into a completely different one. And it's so weird and also not good. And I, I, can't, have, I can't add anything to that having not seen it, although I, it certainly sounds like I understand your point. But just because you mentioned it, I would just thought of Conan the Destroyer as a sequel to Conan the Barbarian. See, I never saw Conan the Destroyer because I know it by reputation. Right. I've seen Conan the Barbarian, right. which is very early 80s, but it's quite good yeah. for what it is. Yeah. And I think Conan the Destroyer... I just didn't work. Like, tried, tried, <laughs> tried to well, be like a D&D &D adventure. It's, <laughs> like, it's PG, first of yeah, all, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah. They, they tried to tone it down and hamstring a lot of what made... Arnold fun to watch in the first one, but yeah, so. yeah. Um, okay, for my next one, actually going back to something that I did mention with Basic Instinct Two, which was a movie that again just came out too late. Uh, it felt like a cash grab by the people involved, and it well, it, I, I think like the actor, much in the way, like not again sounding ageist. Um, but this time I'm flipping it because the the gender I just don't think the actor was physically up for the demands of the role was Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. That yeah, that one was on my list because even though again I'm a little bit of an apologist for that mm -hmm. movie and that again not because I like it but just because I don't hate it to the degree right. a lot of people hate it. But yeah, certainly if you're going to compare it to Last Crusade, right. that's a big drop off. And act although. I will say that if Crystal Skull didn't exist, mm -hmm. Temple of Doom might have gotten a look in on my list. Because I do not really like Temple of Doom. And I and in my mind, Raiders of the Lost Ark is unquestionably the best Indiana Jones movie. Sure. So I do actually consider... I now Temple of Doom is not as bad as Crystal Skull, but I do I do look at that gulf okay, between, between Raiders of the Lost Ark and Temple of Doom. And that, for me at least, is a big gap. So I don't, I don't like the tonal shift in Temple of Doom and how dark it goes, but I like a lot of the other elements. Actually, the darkness of Temple of Doom isn't the thing that bothers me the most. It's how 
It's how they just, like, throw all of the insects and the gore and, like, stuff at you, like, kind of, like... It, it's it, played more for laughs and kind of, like, the gross-out factor without having necessarily the story component. Yeah. So, but, okay, so, but getting into it, my, my thing for Kingdom of the Crystal Skull was, in addition to just kind of not really liking the story or the direction where they were going, I, five minutes into this movie, I was dreadfully concerned, and it was because of Harrison Ford. And I remember thinking, like, he would give interviews, like, back in the 90s and stuff like that. And, like, people were always saying, like, if they ever made another Star Wars, would you go back to playing Han Solo? And he was always kind of like, I don't think so. He's like, I think I did everything there was with that character. It kind of bores me. not really interested. And they would ask, would you ever go back to being Indiana Jones? And he said, I quote, in a New York minute. Like, he would go back like that. He loved that character. He wanted to play that game. I was like, but, gosh, now we're talking about the span of time. I was like, okay... He's an older man. He's, he's not going to be able to do some of the physical things. But, like, his first scene when they pull him out of the trunk of the car and he's talking to, not the Nazis anymore, but the Soviets. And I was just like, he seems bored out of his mind. And if this is a project you have been waiting for for a decade to return to this character, this is a bad sign. Because I just thought he just he wasn't into the character. I don't know what it was. He just seemed like he didn't care. And and it was just bad. And then, like, yeah, there's was, there was a, a scene later in the movie where he's... He's fighting this Soviet soldier by this, like, hill of, like, fire ants. And in every movie, Indiana Jones gets his butt kicked. That's, like, part of the formula. He's always getting beat up until the last minute he fights back or something saves him or something. But, like, this time it was painful to watch because it's like, you're just beating up an old man. (laughs) Like, this is... This, uh, this isn't, like, character building or, like, cool. This is, like, oh, God, stop, stop. He's already dead. See, I, I actually, I give more credit for his performance in that movie than you do, but I will absolutely grant you that fight scene was not fun because right. it, it was, like, you're beating up a senior citizen. What are you doing? <laughs> stop it. They are still planning on making your fifth one. I can't. I, I can't. I know. I know. As much as I don't want them to reboot it, just come up with an original thing, I think I would prefer a reboot to... One with him in it passing the torch to somebody else. Because I also think part of what makes it special is the time period. It, it is. And that was also one of the problems, at least for me, right. with Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. It didn't matter as much once they were in the jungle. Right. But that first stretch when he's like, he's he goes into a diner and there's a jukebox and people in, and girls in poodle skirts. Right. I'm like, what? No. I half expected to see Marty McFly show up in his bathroom. <laughs> and like Indiana Jones goes, did that guy just jump shit? But, yeah. <laughs> well, now see, that... That that would have been one to pull for, wait, God, like a year, two years ago when we did our movie mashups thing. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so, like, I I also had the X-Men franchise on my list. Okay. Twice. Okay. <laughs> Was it Apocalypse and X3? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, X-Men The Last Stand and Apocalypse. Now, I know for you, at least by the criteria I set out, you might not include Apocalypse because you didn't like... Days of Future Past. Well, yes, but I did think that Apocalypse was noticeably worse. Oh my god. I see I like Days of Future Past a lot. Yeah. But and and what was really great like I probably hate Apocalypse more than X-Men The Last Stand. Mm-hmm. Because X-Men The Last Stand, which is again, not good, I at least know why that happened. Right. The creative team that was supposed to make it left jumped ship to do something else right. fox wouldn't move the date mm-hmm. now that's fox being jerks but right. because they wouldn't move the date that means that the actors the screenwriter the director who got saddled with the thing had very little time mm-hmm. and limited resources and so like the production was hamstrung mm-hmm. apocalypse what is your freaking excuse for this it's the same creative team. You set it up at the end of the last one. So obviously it was your intention to do this. They didn't force you to do this. You said how you wanted this to be the next one you did. And you don't seem to understand any of the components that anyone likes about this character. And it's a character I don't even like anyway. But I still recognize that they failed to bring what people like about him about. It's like, what? That's the thing. I don't understand why Apocalypse is as bad as it is. I understand why with Last Stand. I think part of it with Apocalypse was just like, the after you do Days of Future past what stakes can you set up that feel big enough to justify like it's another end of the world situation everything like so uh, yeah i will say i don't think days of future past was a bad movie Mm -hmm. my problems are very subjective and personal bias against like certain things about the franchise and the handling of it like i'm never going to tell somebody it's a bad movie Mm -hmm. it's just i didn't like it for various reasons that have as much to do with me as it does with the film Apocalypse, like, I was checking my watch a no, lot through no. that movie. I was just like, this is boring. Like, I, oh, like, I don't I even know if it's bad because so, I'm not paying attention I anymore. was so bored. 
Yeah. It was it was aggressively mediocre. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It oh so um as for the third one, yeah, I, I hated the third one. I just thought yeah, no. I mean the thing is I can look at like I can look at little things about the third one and still pick out a couple of things. Mm -hmm. Like I can go, I like Kelsey Grammer's Beast. Okay, yeah. Quite a bit. Um, and there are little moments. There are a few things. Some of Magneto's scenes are pretty cool. Like the few things that are good, that are quote unquote good in Apocalypse mm -hmm. is all stuff that was aged from earlier films. Yeah. Oh, look at Magneto suffer this loss. Yeah, he's done that like three times already. Look at the Quicksilver scene. You did it already. Yeah. Like, one uh, thing in the third one that I really thought was clever and I liked the use of it was the uh, little bit with the multiple man and yes. how that threw off like the whole... Like the ambush that they were setting yeah. up for this Here, mutant here's camp. This, here's this whole team of a... Yeah. And it's just... It keeps it's, us shrinking just, like, it's just the it's one just dude. The one, multiple man setting them up, leading them into... So that ambush. Yeah, I like that part. I thought that was clever. But yeah, that didn't, obviously didn't save the movie. All right. So uh, since we're on that, this takes me to uh, another one of the movies, which is in the superhero genre, superhero field. And this one kind of hurt me to put it on the list because it's very near and dear to my heart. It's also the, probably the most recent movie that we, we can look at. Um, and it's not a movie that I would say is bad, but it lets me down in a couple of ways. And it's this past year's Ant-Man and the Wasp. See, I'm both with you and not, because I don't think it's very good, but I also didn't like Ant-Man nearly as much as everyone else seemed to either. Right. So I liked Ant-Man, and at it the is, time... It is yeah. worse, though. I'll absolutely yeah. grant I liked Ant-Man, and at the time, when I first saw Ant-Man and the Wasp, I was like, yeah, that was fun. I kind of liked that. And then the more I sat with it, uh, the more like it, it kept going lower and lower on my list of the Marvel movies. And yeah. now it's bottom five. Um, part of the problem is, like, I, I can't... Explain, like, Paul Rudd is great with his character in Hike. He's very charming. He's very funny. He does a lot of, like, interesting things interacting with the cast and the girl who plays his daughter and everything. But that doesn't disguise the very obvious fact that there's no need for him to be in this movie. No. And, like, when you look at what is set up by the previous one, like, the story kernel is going to get Janet out of the quantum realm. But that plot doesn't require Scott and Scott's involvement at all. No. Nope. That's a Hank and Hope plot. And it's also something that can be done in 15 minutes. It's, like, one of these things that's, like... It's sort of like Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. <laughs> you need to keep throwing outside things... They, yeah, like they, have, they, they have this one goal that should not be that hard, and we're right. just going to keep throwing insane problems. Right, at. but the problem is with him and was one of the things is all of these obstacles are just external things that have nothing to do with like characters or their really like their actions or like responsibilities. So it's not character; it's just stuff to like throw. In. It's like just like hurdles for the sake of hurdles. See, that was and, the thing. I I remember after Liz and I saw it together when mm -hmm. we did our review on it, we were talking about it. And I and I think I realized as we were talking, like the entire subplot with like the I forget who the hell he was, but Walter Goggins, the gangster character, yeah, character, and all those guys. It actually occurred to me, like, oh, I know why they're in here. It was reverse engineered from what action scenes they wanted to do, right? But the quote unquote main villain they had of Ghost isn't going to have henchmen, so they had to insert a whole other villain who would right. have henchmen, so they could have things like the chase scene and the and the right. fight in the kitchen and all this other crap, right? Yeah, yeah, and, and, it's, the, and sto the story is not driving the set pieces. The set pieces are driving the story. Exactly, and exactly. And that's why, work. that's why I think there's a lot of fun in the movie. I will rewatch it from time to time if I need to. Um, I like I like a lot of certain elements of the movie, but it was just like it's a sequel because they wanted to make a sequel, and they just yeah. you're like I think it was reverse engineered. They're like, what do we want to do? What can we do to show off these powers and get people excited? Yeah, and then like we're back because like the story is just so flimsy. And ultimately, it's like, why is Ant Man in Ant Man and the Wasp? Well, because it's a sequel to Ant Man. Yeah, and that's the only reason. And it's just uh, it breaks my heart because I like that character and I want to be <laughs> a bigger fan of that franchise. But uh, no, it fails. All right, I've got one on here that I've actually never seen, but I'll mention it just because it shows up on so many worst lists. Okay. And I'll just acknowledge it here to say that I have nothing to say about it, and that's Son of the Mask. I No, never seen it. Me neither. But supposedly, like, <laughs> like seizure-inducing bad. Mm -hmm. um, but okay. So, so since, since you brought up superheroes... So um, you brought them up first. I did. <laughs> but since we've continued on with superheroes a little bit, Spider-Man 3... Oh, I didn't even think about any of the Spider-Man movies, but yeah. 
I mean, that see, that's the only one I would include, though, because I don't consider Amazing Spider-Man 2 to be that big a drop-off from the previous Amazing Spider-Man, and I'm not going to judge reboot versus totally other continuity. Sure. Like, right. a, a worst of reboots, that's a totally different conversation. At right. least to me it is. Right. Um, so, in terms I, of direct sequels, yeah, Spider-Man... I mean... Spider-Man 2, which is great, to Spider-Man 3, which is... Ah, Right, and I I think a lot of that is is Sony interfering with what Sam Raimi wanted to do. Although that doesn't excuse him, because there are certainly see the thing is I don't let Sam Raimi off. The no, I don't. I, I don't. What well, some uh, people like to go, it's because Sony forced in Venom. I will immediately grant that didn't help. Right, but I actually think Venom's plot, while not representative of what the comics fans like of Venom, I actually think the Venom's plot line is a heck of a lot better than Sandman. Probably. I actually I like the visuals of Sandman, which is why I I, I like, like the visual, that. but I actually hate Sandman a hell of a lot more than I hate Venom. I don't like the way that this character is played out. I hate the way he's crowbarred into the plot yeah. and this whole retconning of of, the, of Uncle Ben's death. Stuff. I hate, and that's completely on Raimi. That was the movie he wanted to make, and I didn't even remember that. I sort of blocked that out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, no, I remember like hating it when I saw it, and at some point it occurred to me like. Every character in this movie has a crying scene. <laughs> Even Harry Osborn's butler has a crying scene at the end of the movie. I'm like, what the heck is going on with this movie? The Sandman is defeated by being brought to tears and blowing away on the wind. Um, I would, if we're, if we're including that though, I would include Amazing Spider-Man 2 because I think it is significantly worse than the S Amazing Spider-Man 1. I don't think Amazing I... Spider-Man 1 is great, but I think there is enough of a disparity and like the sins that Amazing Spider-Man 2 can like creates of just like not being like a story, but just like just See the thing is I stuff. I feel Sp Amazing Spider-Man 2 has has significantly different sins from Amazing Spider-Man mm -hmm. 1. But I do honestly there are components in Amazing Spider-Man 2 that I actually really like. Mm -hmm. They don't pull together, but I Honestly, really like the scene in Times Square when Electro sure. basically oh, first yeah, sure, manifests. I like that yeah. scene a lot. I actually, I mean, the build-up to it means the payoff didn't work, but I actually think Gwen Stacy's death as a scene, as a moment, mm -hmm. was really well handled. I honestly, and I might be the only person on the planet, I honestly like the ending. Okay. Like, leading into, like, leading into the rhino fight, but more importantly, Spider-Man, you know, this kid mm -hmm. standing out in front of the rhino you know, and Spider-Man going, hey... I got it. It's good. I, I I legitimately like that ending. Now, almost everything that goes in between those two things that I like doesn't work, but I can look at Amazing Spider-Man 1 and go, it's more cohesive. I don't think his high points are as high as the high points of Spider of Amazing Spider-Man 2, though. Yeah. There's not there's no individual thing in the in the first Amazing Spider-Man that I like as much as the individual things that I like in Amazing Spider-Man 2. Okay, interesting. Um, since you said that you're probably the only person in the world who, who liked that the ending more, I would throw myself out there and say I might be the only person in the world who actually liked the Amazing Spider-Man 2 Goblin more than the Green Goblin in the first Spider-Man movie. I don't like it more than Willem Dafoe as Norman Osborn, but as the mm -hmm. Goblin, that Power Rangers looking suit that he wore, <laughs> I could never get past that. I'm sorry, like that's the that I could never get past that. And the freaky emo goth the goblin that we got in Amazing Spider-Man 2, well, not good. I was like, but, 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 I'm strangely fascinated by this thing more. But but what what about snowboarding goblin in Spider-Man 3? <laughs> Forgot about that, didn't you? I remember people saying it was going to be like a version of the Hobgoblin. I'm like, sir, <laughs> I've met the Hobgoblin. I know the you, Hobgoblin. You are no Hobgoblin. You are no Hobgoblin. Um, okay, I, th I think I've... I'm not going to actually mention all the ones I've got on here because some of them like I don't have all that much to say about. I need to talk about the, the four that I, I have lumped together for basically all committing the same sin. Okay. So I'm trying to think, do I want to say what the sin is or what the movies are first? I'll then? say what the movies are and I'll, and I'll see if I can all right. figure it out. Ghostbusters 2. Uh-huh. Men in Black 2. Uh-huh. Kingsman the Golden Circle. The Hangover Part 2. Okay, I know a lot of what you're hating about Ghostbusters 2, but I'm not sure if it's... All right, tell me, what is it? what's the come thread? Let's just make the first one again, <laughs> even if it requires us to break everything that 
had happened by the end of the previous. That's movie. where I thought you were going with with um, Hangover Two. Certainly, um, yeah. No, it's it is the reset button. Like first of all, it does kind of what I alluded to when I talked about Highlander Two, which is it is lazy. Yeah. To just go, let's just do the first one again. Right. Is lazy. But in addition to that, with these Hangover Two, I actually have not seen, mm-hmm. but I've read the synopsis, and I'm like, that is literally just the Hangover One sure. set in a different place so I'll lump it in there anyway. But the other three is they literally undo what arcs and development there was by the end of their preceding films. Mm -hmm. In the case of Ghostbusters 2, by breaking up and disbanding the Ghostbusters, so they have to convince people that ghosts are real and come all together again. Men in Black 2, by even though his story was completely finished, bringing back Tommy Lee Jones for no friggin' reason. Right. And then Kingsman 2, which I actually think is the worst of the three, mm-hmm. not only bringing back a dead character, spoilers for all these, but I don't care because they suck. <laughs> um, not only do they bring back a dead character whose death was a big part of the conclusion of the previous guy's story, they co- they completely kill off one of, like, the major female supporting character offhandedly within the first five minutes and barely any ceremony, and the like the one thing that everyone agreed was bad about the first Kingsman, i.e. the butt joke at the mm-hmm. very end of it, not only do they do a joke that was basically just as bad, they doubled down on it and inserted it in the middle of the movie instead of having it be a gag at the plot point. Hmm. I, I I was disappointed walking out of it. I have come to loathe that movie. <laughs> but all four of these. They they literally snap themselves in half, bending over backwards in order to try and be the first one again. And yeah, I, I've talked to you about Ghostbusters too, and a lot of those, and the problems of unnecessarily breaking them up, and just so that they can get back together and have the same conversation with the mayor and the yeah the other government like, official let's, tool. Who's... Let's just make the same movie again. Well, we can't make the same movie again because they ended in different places than they started the first time. Okay, we'll set them back to square one. Well, that Ooh. is actually. That's not the exact reason, but that is similar to why one of the movies on my list is Terminator 3. Oh, okay. Which does do a lot, it is basically kind of like repeats a lot of Terminator 2. But for me, the biggest sin is it negates Terminator 2. Mm. And again, like that was, you could argue that Terminator didn't need a sequel, but James Cameron made a sequel and made it better than the previous one. It wasn't better than the previous one, but it was still very good. Okay, we'll, we'll argue that one some other time. <laughs> um, but you definitely, like, at that point, again, ambiguity of the ending, but now we're going to screw up the ambiguity of the ending by showing you the next chapter and that there is a certain fixed thing that the, the fate can be changed and everything. And this whole, they, just like the ending, I just felt like it was kind of like a big screw you to what was special about Terminator 2. But they also came in with the same thing, which was that Arnold came in, he was the hero again. He was the protector from a new version of the Terminator that's trying to kill John, like, the same way. It was just a lot of repetition, a lot of the same thing, but also spinning the wheels and, like, ruining what I liked about the first, about the previous Terminators. I think the only reason I didn't put that on my list is I I keep forgetting that that movie exists. (laughs) Yeah. No, I I literally forget (laughs) forget about that movie. Well. Oh, boy. Um, So... After that, another one, uh, another sci- beloved sci-fi franchise picking up another sequel to a James Cameron movie. I was going to say, you're going to bring up Alien 3, aren't you? And now this is the one where I actually think Alien 3 is a solid movie. Except I think it, for the first five minutes. That completely so here's puts the a thing. damper on the whole thing. I think it is a problematic, often hated sequel that could have been fixed very simply by not making Ripley the main character. If you recast, remake somebody else, some other strange woman falls on this planet, this prison planet full of men, and she brings the alien with her, you tell a completely separate story. You don't handcuff this entire franchise to one particular actress who the producers, and by then she was a producer of it, wanted it to be all based on her and she wanted to... But then you don't have to kill off the family unit that we established in the last one and this loving sort of like hopeful ending you're not giving the middle finger to all of that and you just have another it's a little bit more of a rehash of the first one then because then you've just basically got these characters trapped in a box with a monster in the dark 
but the different scenery, the, the sort of religious themes that are try to be inserted in there but don't quite land, at least you can play off with that. And I think a lot of that is David Fincher was his first directorial feature, just lifting this thing on his shoulders and trying to come up with something that would work. But, yeah. And that was a script that had been rejiggered like five times. Well, they completely changed the premise of the planet yeah. they were on yeah. halfway into pre-production. Right. Um, but see, here's the thing. Like, I'm not going to disagree that that's a, that's, a, that's a bad idea, but I would actually say it's not even necessary to have it not be Ripley. All you have to do, it's the most minor of tweaks to... She's separated, but Newton and Hicks... She's the only one ejected because her pod is the only one compromised. So Newton too. and Hicks stay on the ship. Right. They live. What she fought to save is still saved. Right. We don't completely crap all over what... I mean, you could still say it ruins the happy ending because she doesn't get to be... She doesn't get to mm -hmm. have a happy ending. But what? But she wasn't fighting for herself. She was fighting specifically for Newt. So... Honestly, it's the killing of Newt that is, for me, is the original sin of Alien 3, especially considering I consider it completely unnecessary to the plot. There is no reason that she needs to die in order for the rest of the story to happen. Absolutely none. And I just think that's... Because I was a fan of the Aliens franchise and, like, the comics and, like, other books and everything, like, I felt that making it a Ripley story again made the universe smaller and just kind of attached it to this because by then like when they eventually decide to make like alien resurrection like you know uh, eight years later or whatever it was or not even that much but then it was like well the only way the story makes sense is if we clone ripley and we bring her back to life it's like just come up with some different characters like these aliens aren't <laughs> like ripley didn't create these characters there's not a symbiotic relationship here like have some other blood in this and well, i felt like they just they See, here's the thing, like, I get it to a certain extent, and here's why, because you start cycling in other characters completely, mm -hmm. and then the Alien franchise becomes just another horror franchise where you where you cycle in new fodder every time. It becomes a sci-fi equivalent of Nightmare on Elm Street or Friday the 13th, or at least it risks becoming that. Potentially. Um, so I, I, I feel like... I feel like keeping her around was at least partly initially mm -hmm. sort of in the interest of not becoming like those kinds of horror franchises where it's just just drop the monster in with a new bunch of people to rip into every time. I think the budgetary constraints of the setting at least would kind of suggest that it could be a venue for more auteur horror filmmakers and not, you know, somebody coming up with like a 20 you know, million dollar budget or something like that, but... I mean, you'd think so, but I, I mean, the thing is, like, look at what has been done with, well, the, with the Alien films that have not included Ripley. Well, the next They have not been any better. Right, and part of that, I would argue, is, again, studio interference and a mandate that they have to be PG-13 uh, for at least the Alien vs. Predator ones, and then the Prometheus and the Covenant, which... I actually thought about including Covenant, and then I realized I hated Prometheus. So. <laughs> um, I didn't. I did not see Covenant. I you've did... seen it. Have you seen the first two movies? <laughs> okay, so I've seen. It. You've seen Alien and Aliens. You've seen Covenant. Yeah. Right. I I actually don't hate Prometheus. Okay. It's got a lot of problems, and I I don't like. I get it, but I don't hate it. Hmm. Um, but I saw the first trailer for Covenant. And I'm like, no, nope, don't care. No. Well. If you liked Prometheus, there's no reason for you to like Covenant. Oh, okay. If I mean, that, if you didn't like Prometheus like I did, there's also no reason for you to like Covenant. Well, see, that was the thing. Like, I there were a lot of flaws in Prometheus, but I liked what it was doing. I liked that it was trying to move the story away from the confines of the Xenomorph because mm -hmm. I felt like if you were going to try and expand it, you need to get away from that creature because that does just turn it into a recycling horror mm -hmm. franchise. So, I, I saw a potential in Prometheus. I liked it, but I really wanted to see the follow-up. I, I wanted to see where they went after that. And they decided to just... I could tell just from the trailer and everything I've read bears this out. They decided to just scrap all that and just mess around with aliens again. And I'm like, eh, now I don't care. Right, your, your voice was in the minority of the fans because who just yeah. wanted another alien movie. So they were like, 
All right, well, we'll fine. Literally... Well, here's here's another alien movie. Yeah, we'll drop a bomb on the plan that you could have had for the follow up to yeah. this, and make sure that that never comes to fruition. Yeah, I I accept that I'm in the minority of people <laughs> who actually wanted a proper follow up to Prometheus, but with what they did, they literally satisfied nobody. <laughs> You probably had a lot of minority opinions throughout your life. Apologies if the image just like jumped around. I'm still figuring this camera out. <laughs> Anyways, I think you had one more. I do have one more. Um, and controversial pick, and I don't want to completely. Well, I can't derail. be the only one with controversial opinions. Come on. And this is actually one that I think you and I are kind of on the same wavelength for this movie. All right. Um, but the reason that I have it on my list. And the movie itself is Star Wars The Last Jedi. Ah, uh, yes. Now, the reason I put this on my list, for a very specific reason, I kind of want to just limit the discussion of the movie to one particular thing. And it's, the reason this is on my list is because it makes me like the previous movie, The Force Awakens, less. I have my... I, I, we've talked about this enough that I think I know why that is, but why don't you tell the people at home? Okay, uh, so um, credit to Mike Gillis from the podcast Radio vs. the Martians and Podcast of La Vista, baby. Because uh, he actually had... He articulated something about The Force Awakens that I think is kind of like brilliant and I was never able to actually say. Um, but he described The Force Awakens as a remix of the original Star Wars. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of... A great way of like looking at it because it, it kind of says it explains and almost kind of justifies and excuses why it is story-wise kind of a remake of the original with a lot of the same kind of plot beats and and themes but a little bit jazzier you know there's yeah. a little bit like dj you know skips and everything like that but that works and you can excuse that and you can even embrace that and love it if that's a one-off experience mm. a remix of the first one that type of like love letters that is not where you begin a new saga or a new trilogy or the or continuation of this saga with these new characters. Because what The Last Jedi then did was kind of have to pick up those pieces and say, well, this stuff is just a retread of that, so we don't like that, so we're just going to ignore it, we're going to just can all that, or this character is pointless, so we're just going to kill him off, and we're going to do all of these other things. And it just kind of, by approaching the world the way The Last Jedi did, which was to kind of say everything you liked about the other movie, we're going to flip it on its head for sort of the sake of flipping it. Kind of like, it just made me feel like The, La the Force Awakens didn't, not that it didn't matter, but it just kind of made me feel like it was like, I liked it for the wrong reasons. Well, it, cer it certainly felt like The Last Jedi was telling you that you yeah. liked it for the wrong reasons. And sort of, because you and I are pretty much on the same page with the Last Jedi, which is that we both dislike it, but not for the right. And this not, is not not for the most frequently quoted reasons on the internet that people have for disliking. And this is why I haven't even done a review of the movie on the Star Wars podcast that I used to host because I don't want people to just to assume, oh Ryan hates the movie. Well, he's one of the people that try to trash Kelly Mary Tran until she leaves social media. Yeah, he must be one of the people who wants to like sign a petition to get it remade. <laughs> That's not on Lucasfilm's I, I mean, dime. I I, uh, I, I want to I want to check. <laughs> in on how that thing's doing yeah. that's the stupidest friggin thing like it, like that like I didn't like that movie but I hated Star Wars fandom after that movie and I yeah. just I didn't want to be yeah. associated with the people who hate that movie for I think the wrong reasons my problems with the movie are just very different but one of them and the the thing that I the sequelness of it that bothers me is just I was like well I really like The Force Awakens but now I don't and it's because like I was counting on this move. I was counting on the last Jedi to salvage things about the Force Awakens that I knew were problems, like the way the government had been established and not really set up, and like the way the characters were kind of locked into the same roles that they were in forty years earlier. Yeah, and like Luke just looking like a bitter old version of Obi Wan, and the First Order being the Empire two point and the Resistance being the Rebellion two point oh. I was like, well, it can't be that simple because that means everything they fought for in the last trilogy didn't matter. There's got to be something else more to this. And the last Jedi said, nope, that's exactly what it is, and it was stupid, so we don't care about it. I'm like. Okay, well, that's depressing. 
See, it's funny because you took on on board the big complaint I had before the, before the Force Awakens had even come out. Before the last year that came out, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. we had that conversation yeah, we did. We did. on your podcast. Yeah, we talked about it a long time ago. You were like, I, a, a sequel kind of ruins Return of the Jedi for it. Yeah. <laughs> so fun, that's kind of funny to me. I, I I am with you because the for me the the big things like I. Part of why I don't like The Last Jedi, I don't think it's the only reason, but part of why I don't like The Last Jedi is as a sequel to The Force Awakens specifically. Mm-hmm. Because it does feel like a very cruel bait and switch sure. on fans. Because for the first sequel to this franchise in 30, yeah, 30 plus years, and everything about the sequel from who's in it to how it's shot to the mm-hmm. plot like you said it's a remix all of it says it's star wars as you remember it it's a nostalgia trip yes and then That's the what last thinking of, yeah. and then the last jedi goes this is not nostalgia the star wars. is for idiots yeah, this is not the star wars you remember and honestly either one of those is fine but it's not okay to set up your new trilogy on the basis of one and then come in with the other right that I feel is cruel to fans because that is going here. You want this carrot? It's not a carrot. It's a truncheon. And now I'm going to beat you with it, <laughs> which is why like, and unfortunately I think, <laughs> I think they screwed up that way because I think Ryan Johnson could make a really cool trilogy completely separated from the saga and doing his own vision. His, his which supposedly own style, he's own... now working on. And now I wish they just had him do that. But the thing is like with, the last shot being as divisive and as hated by a lot of people as it is, like, I don't know if that trilogy is going to happen. Yeah, I don't know either. Like, but, like, if he was going to make a Star Wars, I wish they just had him do that. Right. And the other thing is, and I've even seen people defend The Last Jedi on the basis of going, it's deconstructionist. Mm-hmm. And I actually, I don't disagree, but to me that's damning. Because what do you do when you deconstruct something? You destroy it! Right. That is the nature of deconstructionist narrative, is to pull the thing apart and dissect it. And when you do that, you kill it. Right. That's why the great deconstructionist work on, on in ongoing franchises like the like the Dark Knight Returns, like Superman Red Sun, like Watchmen, right. which was originally conceived to be all these Charlton characters. Mm-hmm. It's why all of these are allegories to existing characters or are out of continuity takes on them. You can't deconstruct in a story you are trying to continue moving forward. And that's why the people who love the Dark Knight and Red Sun and Watchmen and these movies and under or those books, sorry, and understand what makes them special, why those people hate the sequels that were created for Watchmen and the Dark Knight and that was the Yeah. Oh man. So those I mean, yeah, those those were the ones I got. Um and for the various various reasons. A lot of times I think these were sequels that should not have been because the movie before them did not require a sequel and, and they were probably best left either open-ended or the opposite, just very finite, yeah. and throwing in a sequel for the purposes of making more money and doing another sequel it was just wrong-headed. Sometimes they just pass their pi- like prime. Like I haven't seen Incredibles 2. I think Incredibles 2 could get away with that because it's animated. So, yeah, okay. So, I, you think not. Incredibles 2 is not bad. It is incredibly unnecessary. True. And it was absolutely not worth the wait. Right. It is it is the exact sequel that I would have accepted two years after the Incredibles years ago, yeah. came out. Yeah. Not what is it, 14 years later? Sure, at least. Like, no. Yeah. No. 14 years later, this is the best you could, uh, could come up with. No, this was not worth the wait. It's not. I mean, it, do- it doesn't ruin the previous one. It doesn't make a lot of the mistakes that I was expecting it to make, but it still isn't very good, and it's not a worthy successor to the original. And I see these gushing reviews every now and then. I'm like, what movie did you see? And so help me God, if The Incredibles 2 wins for Best Animated Feature over Into the Spider-Verse just because it's Pixar, there better be a pillow within reach because whatever I get my hands on first, I'm going to throw. I think people will riot. So I mean, well, they should have rioted when Brave won, but they let that slide because it's Pixar. Mm. Like Pixar movies are good, but like at this point, I kind of have I kind of have a bone in my craw over how much of a pass that company gets mm. just because of the brand name. Mm. So, so yeah, those are the other the other sequels that I mentioned. I had problems with just because they spit on or cropped on something that was great about the one before it. Actually, um, you, you know what I could have put on here? 
I don't feel like talking about it again because it's too soon. I could have talked about Wreck-It Ralph 2. Okay. But I've already got a review of it. I don't want to. Okay. So... <laughs> there, you, there you go. So uh, I, think we'll, I think we'll wrap it up there. Uh, what do you folks think are some really bad... Well, what do you think about the ones we talked about? I'm sure many of you will disagree with at least some of the things we've said. Oh, I'm sure somebody out there thinks The Godfather 2 and Wrath of Khan deserve to be on our list. <laughs> If somebody wants to make that argument in sincerity, <laughs> I actually want to hear it. But whatever your thoughts are, drop something down in the comments. Let's talk about it. There's also a whole bunch of buttons down there, and there's a link to the Patreon if you feel like supporting what I do. And there's other things besides. Um, check them out if you want. If you don't, that's okay, too, because at the end of the day, you're the council. I just run the meetings occasionally with this doofus in tow. So, no, you're right. This wasn't as good as the last time I was on I the know. Until next time, this council is adjourned. Thank you.